So when you hear immigration, most people think of Latin America and the border. But I assume most people in this room already have an opinion on the border. You know, it's a humanitarian crisis. You already know what you think. So I'm going to spend my time today talking about a less discussed type of immigration, and that is high-skilled immigration, uh, because that is the kind of immigration that even many Republicans will say that they're for. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard a politician say, I want to make it harder to come here illegally, but easier for the best and brightest to come here illegally. We should staple a green card to their diplomas. I'm, I'm sure you've all heard that one. That's a terrible idea. And my message to everyone here today is that you should never allow yourself to be pressured or emotionally blackmailed into supporting higher levels of white collar immigration in the mistaken assumption that it will somehow balance out the supposed heartlessness or racism of wanting to reduce low-skilled illegal immigration. Uh, High-skilled immigration, which in many cases means Asian immigration, is the piece of the immigration puzzle that, that I have a lot of experience with personally, because I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. I don't know if anyone else here is. Uh, but that's the land of the Research Triangle Park. So my graduating class in high school was about half Asian, a lot of kids whose moms and dads worked at Glaxo or IBM. And then I spent most of the last decade living in Sydney, Australia, and our apartment there was in Sydney's Koreatown. So 95% of our neighbors were either Korean or Chinese or Tamil. And if you walk down the main strip, all of the shop signs were in Korean, all the people who worked in the shops were Korean. So I've had a lot of experience with Asian immigrants, not just in ones and twos, but in places where they demographically predominate. And that experience has left me with a very favorable impression of Asian immigrants. They are really great people. Um, I can't say enough good things about them. Nevertheless, I strongly believe that immigration from Asia to the United States should be reduced, rolled back from its current level. What is its current level? Let's start our discussion there. Um, for more than 10 years, the United States has accepted more immigrants from Asia than from Latin America. So it's really a mistake when you hear immigration to think of Latin American immigration. We take more people from China and India than we do from Mexico. Uh, pop quiz for the people in the room. What share of the STEM workforce in the United States uh, is foreign born? And that's across all STEM fields, engineering, math, medicine. Do you think it's 10%? Do you think it's 15%? It's actually 23%. It's just about one in four. Um, and if you look at particular fields, of course, that number is higher. Software developers in the United States are about 40% foreign born. Doctors, about one in four foreign born. For physicians, it's closer to one in three. And if you drill down to particular localities, uh, often the number goes higher. Tech workers in Silicon Valley, 60% foreign born. Um, so this is not a marginal, minor factor in the American labor force. Certainly not if you're an American college graduate who just graduated with a degree in computer science trying to find a job that's going to give you a middle class standard of living. And speaking of education, in STEM graduate programs, the numbers are even more lopsided. A majority of STEM graduate students in the United States are foreign born. And in certain disciplines like electrical engineering, it's up to about 80%. So why is this a bad thing? Why is this a problem if we're bringing people with these skills to the United States? Um, there are four reasons, and I will tick through them as quickly as I can. The first is the obvious one, that it lowers wages and makes it harder to find a job for Americans with those skills. Uh, and keep in mind, these are the people who did everything right. You know, these are the people we told them, if you study hard, get into a good school, don't spend your four years in college slacking off and phoning it in your way to an English degree, buckle down, take organic chemistry, take these hard classes, and if you do that, the economy will find a middle class place for you. These are the people, uh, our highest achievers, our best and brightest, who are being displaced by workers who are undercutting their wages by 40 or 50%. The second reason is that it's often bad for the foreign born workers themselves uh, and for the companies that employ them because it makes them dependent on a labor model that is in many ways indistinguishable from indentured servitude. 
Many of you may know that visas like the H-1B visa are linked to a particular company. So if you lose your job with that company, you don't just lose your job, you also lose your, you get kicked out of the country, um, which gives employers an enormous amount of leverage, which it, you know, is not unheard of for them to abuse. One company that employed a lot of H-1B visa workers was Theranos, the Elizabeth Holmes medical fraud company. And I just want to read you a very short passage from the coverage of her trial. American and British-born scientists were fired for saying this goal was too ambitious, or quit when they realized it didn't work. Who replaced them? Almost all immigrants from India on H-1B visas dependent on the company to remain in the country. With a despotic boss like Sonny, Sonny Balwani, Elizabeth Holmes' uh, Indian boyfriend, uh, it was akin to indentured servitude. Sonny also had the master-servant mentality common among his generation of Indian businessmen. Employees were treated as his minions, and he expected them to be at his disposal at all hours of the day or night. So that kind of situation is bad in general, because we should not have indentured servitude in the United States. Uh, but in this particular case, you can see it was bad because workers in that situation were not able to expose the fraud that they knew was going on at that company. The word fraud brings me to bullet point number three, which is a very sensitive topic, but I think we can't avoid talking about it. Uh, it is simply a fact that fraud and cheating and academic dishonesty are regarded very differently in China and India than they are here in the United States. Many people in this room are college students. We've got a lot of students here. Many of you probably attend schools with large numbers of international students. I am sure you have observed organized cheating rings. Uh, I was recently at an alumni event at my alma mater, and I asked students there, both international students and uh, American-born students whose parents were Indian or Chinese immigrants, uh, and they all said that from day one of enrolling in their classes, they were inundated with WhatsApp messages offering services of essay writing, or to sell them copies of tests in advance, or to involve them in homework rings where they would give you the answer to that big problem set. If you talk to professors at schools that have large numbers of international students, uh, they'll tell you, I mean, they'll tell you off the record, um, that the, for example, the test of English as a foreign language, which is supposed to test your English proficiency in order to come here and become an international student, they see students every year whose scores indicate that they ought to be proficient in English, but who, when you meet the student, can't carry on a simple conversation, can't follow a simple lecture. Professors will only tell you this off the record for a lot of reasons. One, because the schools don't want to publicize that they now have a cheating problem, but also because it can get them in trouble. I'll tell you an anecdote from the University of Maryland, uh, just in our backyard here. A professor there at their business school ended up having to throw out all of the results of a final exam for one of his classes because cheating was so rampant. And in telling his students, in telling his class that he was throwing out all of their test scores, he expressed his dismay at the rise in academic dishonesty that he had observed in the period when foreign students from China had begun to enroll in large numbers in, his, in the business school there. That professor, was forced to resign because the Chinese students whose cheating he had detected went to the administration and accused him of racial profiling. This is very common. You see it a lot at the UC schools in California, which also have large numbers uh, of foreign students from China. They have learned that if you cry racial profiling, it can insulate students from scrutiny into cheating and make life hell for any professor uh, who accuses you of it. Um, so this kind of fraud is under-discussed, and it's important to talk about it, even though it's a difficult issue. One, because cheating is contagious. Um, if I don't want to see the stigma on cheating erode in America to the levels where it is uh, in India and China. Two, because it's not going to stay on campus. Uh, it's going to follow this, uh, them into their careers as pharmacists or researchers, and at that point, it starts affecting all of us. Uh, but the third reason, which is under-discussed, uh, I will have my final quote where I'm reading. There's a pseudonymous blogger called The Education Realist who teaches public school out in California who writes a lot about Asian cheating. Uh, and he uh, said something very moving. He said, 
in the traditional weeding out courses in STEM majors and colleges, like organic chemistry for pre-med, the willingness to accept cheating is convincing a lot of American kids that they aren't smart enough for tough courses because they don't cheat and they aren't aware that others do. So that's who I think about when I think about the rise of cheating and, and how it affects the rest of us. Uh, my final fourth bullet point, which I will dispense with in 30 seconds, is that the Asian American vote in the last presidential election went Biden over Trump something like 70-30. Chinese Americans, Indian Americans, Korean Americans, I think it was closer to 80-20. Um, and this is a persistent pattern that we observe in election after election. Even in cases where you might expect it to go the other way, we had the gubernatorial election in Virginia very recently, Terry McAuliffe versus Glenn Youngkin, and I, had a, I heard a lot of Republican analysts expecting that Asian parents were gonna tip for Youngkin because education was a big uh, issue in that election, and Youngkin really staked his campaign on saying, I'm against CRT, I don't want any of that nonsense, and of course Asian parents hate CRT, um, and Lee Youngkin was saying, I'm going to teach your kids what they actually need to know. I'm not going to get rid of selective admissions at schools like TJ. Do you think Glenn Youngkin won the Asian vote? Do you think he broke even on the Asian vote? When the exit polls came out, Glenn Youngkin's share of the, uh, Glenn Youngkin won 30% of the Asian vote. So I know a lot of people, a lot of conservatives who think um, that Asian American voters should be Republicans because they tend to be wealthier, they've got great family values. I agree with that. I think they should be. I think everybody should be, uh, but I think they should be. But we, we can simply observe that they're not. And if there's any fundamental lesson we can take away from decades of failed immigration policy, it's that when we invite people to come here, we're not just inviting workers. We're inviting our neighbors, and we're inviting our fellow citizens. And so the fact that they're voting record tips so heavily for one party over the other is not something that we can ignore.